In the heart of medieval London, where the River Thames cut through the city like a lifeline, a vision was taking shape, one that would forever change the course of British history. Picture the early 11th century. London was not yet the sprawling metropolis we know today, but it was rapidly becoming the center of trade and political power in England. The air was thick with the scent of commerce, and the streets bustled with merchants and nobles, each vying for their place in a city on the rise. Yet amidst this burgeoning growth, there was a pressing need, a need for a symbol of authority, a place where the threads of power could be woven into the fabric of the nation. Enter King Edward the Confessor, a ruler with a vision far beyond his time. As he surveyed the landscape of his kingdom, Edward saw more than just the bustling city streets. He saw the future. He knew that to cement the monarchy's place at the heart of England, he needed a grand residence, a seat of power that would reflect the strength and unity of his reign. But what Edward could not have foreseen was how the very site he chose, an unassuming piece of land known as Thorny Island, would become the epicenter of British governance, the place where decisions that shape the world would be made. The early foundations laid by Edward, the transformation from a simple abbey to a royal palace, and the ambitious construction that followed would set the stage for centuries of history. But what would unfold within its walls, the monumental decisions and the events that would challenge the very core of the kingdom were yet to come. Hey everyone, and welcome back to Compelling History. Today we'll be continuing this month's topic with another iconic landmark, the Palace of Westminster, a place where some of Britain's best and worst political decisions have been made. But before we begin to unravel the centuries-long history of Westminster, we'd really appreciate if you could give this video a like. And if you enjoyed this video and want to see more, make sure you're subscribed. Speaking of more videos, make sure you check out some of our previous series covering topics like historical inflection points and the history of Pan Am. Now let's get into the video! In the early 11th century, London was a burgeoning metropolis, the epicenter of trade and political intrigue in England. It was a time of growing economic prosperity, fueled by the city's strategic position along the River Thames, which facilitated trade and commerce. Politically, England was evolving into a more centralized state, with power increasingly concentrated in the hands of the monarchy. The need for a stable and grandiose seat of government became apparent as the country sought to assert its authority and manage its affairs more efficiently. The conception of the Palace of Westminster can be traced back to the reign of King Edward the Confessor. Edward, who ruled from 1042 to 1066, desired a residence that would reflect the growing power and sophistication of his court. At that time, the political landscape was characterized by a delicate balance of power between the monarchy and the nobility. London, as the kingdom's heart, needed a symbol that embodied royal authority and the emerging central government. However, the history of the Palace of Westminster began even earlier. In the early 8th century, an Anglo-Saxon church dedicated to St. Peter the Apostle, known as the Westminster, with St. Paul's being the Eastminster, was established on the site. By the 10th century, this church had become a Benedictine abbey and was adopted as a royal church, eventually transforming into a royal palace in the 11th century. The decision to construct the Palace of Westminster was driven by several factors. The existing royal residence in London, located at Thorny Island, was insufficient to accommodate the king's needs and the administrative machinery required to govern the realm. Moreover, the palace was intended to serve not only as a royal residence, but also as a center for governance and justice. It would house the royal council, which advised the king and provide a venue for important state functions and ceremonies. Neither the buildings used by the Anglo-Saxons nor those used by William I survive. The oldest existing part of the palace, Westminster Hall, dates from the reign of William the Rhone's successor, King William VI. The economic conditions in London during this period were favorable for such a grand project. The city was experiencing a period of growth, with increased trade bringing wealth and resources. This economic prosperity allowed for the allocation of funds and resources necessary for the construction of a new impressive palace. Additionally, the development of Westminster was part of a broader trend of urbanization and the construction of monumental buildings across Europe. The construction of the Palace of Westminster was ordered by King Edward the Confessor himself. His vision was to create a royal palace that would not only serve as a residence but also symbolize the monarchy's authority and the unity of the kingdom. The choice of Westminster, a location on the banks of the Thames, was strategic. It provided easy access to the river, facilitating transportation and trade, and was situated close to the city of London, the kingdom's commercial hub. 
The Palace of Westminster was the monarch's principal residence in the late medieval period. The predecessor of Parliament, the Curia Regis Royal Council, met in Westminster Hall, although it followed the king when he moved to other palaces. The Model Parliament, the first official Parliament of England, met there in 1295, and almost all subsequent English parliaments and later British parliaments after 1707 have met at the palace. In 1512, during the early years of the reign of King Henry VIII, a fire destroyed the royal residential area of the palace. In 1534, Henry VIII acquired York Place from Cardinal Thomas Wolsey, renaming it the Palace of Whitehall and using it as his principal residence. Although Westminster officially remained a royal palace, it was used by the two houses of parliament and by the various royal law courts. Because it was originally a royal residence, the palace included no purpose-built chambers for the two houses. Important state ceremonies were held in the painted chamber, originally built in the 13th century as the main bedchamber for King Henry III. The House of Lords originally met in the Queen's Chamber, a modest medieval hall towards the southern end of the complex, with the adjoining Prince's Chamber used as the robing room for peers and for the monarch during state openings. The construction of the Palace of Westminster marked a significant moment in England's history. It represented the consolidation of royal power, the centralization of government, and the kingdom's increasing stability and prosperity. The palace would go on to become a symbol of British governance and a cornerstone of the nation's political and judicial systems. In the heart of London, along the northern bank of the River Thames, an ambitious construction project began in the early 19th century, set to redefine the city's skyline and its political centre. The Palace of Westminster, envisioned as a grand seat of British governance, was to rise from the ashes of its predecessor, which had been ravaged by a devastating fire in 1834. The new structure would not only house the nation's government, but also stand as a testament to the era's architectural and engineering prowess. The selection of the palace's location was both practical and symbolic. The site had long been a hub of British politics, home to the medieval Westminster Hall and the Old Palace, which had served as the royal residence and the heart of governance since the 11th century. The decision to rebuild on this historic ground was a nod to continuity and tradition, ensuring that the legacy of British parliamentary history would be preserved and honoured. In 1547, the building became available for the Commons' use following the disbanding of St. Stephen's College. Over the next three centuries, alterations were made to St. Stephen's Chapel for the convenience of the lower house, gradually destroying or covering up its original medieval appearance. A major renovation project, undertaken by Christopher Wren in the late 17th century, completely redesigned the building's interior. From the 18th century onwards, significant alterations were made to the palace as Parliament struggled with limited space and aging buildings. Calls for an entirely new palace went unheeded, and instead, more buildings of varying quality and style were added. John Vardy designed a new west façade, known as the Stone Building, built in the Palladian style between 1755 and 1770, providing more space for document storage and committee rooms. A new official residence for the Speaker of the House of Commons was completed in 1795. Between 1799 and 1801, the neo-Gothic architect James Wyatt carried out works on both the House of Lords and Commons, including alterations to St. Stephen's Chapel's exterior and a much derided new neo-Gothic building referred to by critics as the Cotton Mill. Johnson significantly remodeled the palace complex between 1824 and 1827. His work included new library facilities, new law courts, and a royal gallery and ceremonial entrance at the southern end of the palace. Soane's use of neoclassical architectural styles caused controversy, conflicting with the Gothic style of the original buildings. Construction officially began in 1840, following a rigorous design competition won by Charles Barry, a skilled architect with a vision for a Gothic revival masterpiece. Barry's design, complemented by the artistic flair of Augustus Pugin, who provided intricate Gothic detailing, promised a majestic blend of modernity and medieval grandeur. The foundation stone was laid in 1840, marking the start of a challenging and ambitious project. The construction phase was marked by numerous notable events and challenges. One of the most remarkable was the engineering feat of building the clock tower, now famously known as Big Ben. The tower's intricate iron frame and stone cladding required innovative techniques and meticulous craftsmanship. The installation of the Great Bell, Big Ben itself, in 1859 was a particularly momentous occasion, though it was not without its trials. The first bell cracked under the hammer's weight, necessitating a replacement. 
Another significant milestone was the completion of the central lobby and the House of Lords chamber, which showcased Pugin's stunning interiors, including rich tapestries, stained glass, and ornate woodwork. The attention to detail and the commitment to Gothic aesthetics were evident throughout, from the grand facades to the smallest interior flourishes. These elements not only enhanced the visual impact of the building, but also conveyed a sense of solemnity and authority appropriate for the seat of the British Parliament. As construction progressed, the site became a hive of activity. Hundreds of artisans, laborers, and craftsmen worked tirelessly, often in challenging conditions, to bring Barry and Pugin's vision to life. Despite delays, budget overruns, and the immense scale of the project, the dedication of all involved ensured steady progress. The grand opening of the Palace of Westminster in 1870, though not marked by a single event, was a moment of great pride and celebration. The new palace, with its iconic towers, expansive riverfront, and richly decorated interiors, was a marvel of Gothic Revival architecture. It stood as a beacon of British resilience and ingenuity, ready to serve as the home of Parliament and a symbol of the nation's democratic values. The Palace of Westminster faced further trials during the Second World War when it was hit by bombs on 14 separate occasions. The worst raid occurred on the night of May 10, 11, 1941, when the palace took at least 12 hits, resulting in the destruction of the Commons Chamber and significant damage to the Lord's Chamber and Clock Tower. Despite the devastation, the Great Clock continued to keep time accurately. Post-war reconstruction was overseen by architect Giles Gilbert Scott, who rebuilt the Commons Chamber in a simplified version of its original style. The new chamber was opened by King George VI in 1950, and the Lord's Chamber was renovated and reoccupied in 1951. This majestic structure, born from the ashes of its predecessor and crafted with care and artistry, would soon become one of the most recognizable buildings in the world. However, the true significance of the Palace of Westminster would unfold in the years to come as it became the stage for pivotal moments in British and world history. After the construction of the Palace of Westminster in the mid-19th century, the grand neo-Gothic structure became the seat of British political power, housing both the House of Commons and the House of Lords. Designed by Charles Barry and Augustus Pugin, the palace was not merely an architectural marvel but a symbol of the enduring British constitution and democracy. Over the years, the palace witnessed numerous pivotal events. In 1908, it was within these hallowed halls that the Liberal government under Prime Minister H. H. Asquith debated and eventually passed the Old Age Pensions Act, laying the groundwork for the modern welfare state. The 1911 Parliament Act further underscored the palace's role in shaping British governance by limiting the power power of the House of Lords, thereby cementing the supremacy of the elected House of Commons. As time passed, the palace became the stage for addressing evolving societal issues. The decriminalization of homosexuality in 1967, the abolition of capital punishment in 1969, and the debates leading to the UK's entry into and exit from the European Union are just a few examples of the historic decisions made within its walls. These events not only shaped the United Kingdom, but also reverberated globally, influencing democratic principles worldwide. Today, the Palace of Westminster remains an active parliament building, buzzing with political activity. Visitors can witness debates and committee sessions, providing a rare glimpse into the democratic process. The iconic Big Ben, officially the Elizabeth Tower, stands as a sentinel, tolling the hours with a resonant chime that echoes across London. Touring the palace offers a unique journey through history. The central lobby, with its stunning mosaics and statues of past monarchs, serves as a crossroads of British political life, where MPs and lords cross paths. The majestic Westminster Hall, the oldest part of the palace dating back to 1097, stands as a testament to medieval architecture and has hosted countless significant events, including coronation banquets and the trials of Guy Fawkes and King Charles I. Visitors are often struck by the rich symbolism embedded in the architecture, from the intricate carvings in the Commons Chamber to the ornate throne in the Lord's Chamber. Each detail reflects the grandeur and gravitas of a nation steeped in history. Interestingly, the Chamber of the House of Commons has not allowed smoking since the 17th century. Members may take snuff instead, with a snuff box still kept by doorkeepers for this purpose. Smoking anywhere inside the palace has not been permitted since 2005. The rules of conduct within the chambers are equally fascinating. Members may not eat or drink in the chamber, with the exception of the Chancellor of the Exchequer, who may have a beverage of their choice while delivering the budget statement. Traditionally an alcoholic beverage, though recent chancellors have opted for water. 
Formal attire is mandatory. Men in suits, women in business-like clothing, and t-shirts with slogans are prohibited. Hats are not worn, military decorations are avoided, and hands must not be in pockets, a rule enforced as recently as 1994. Only guide dogs, police dogs, and police horses are allowed inside the palace. Speeches may not be read out, though notes can be referred to, and visual aids and applause are generally discouraged in the commons. The exterior of the palace, particularly the Elizabeth Tower, which houses Big Ben, is recognized worldwide. Tsar Nicholas I once called it a dream in stone. Its setting on the bank of the River Thames makes it one of the most visited tourist attractions in London. Thank you so much for watching our video on the Palace of Westminster. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you drop us a like, and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss the next video in our series on iconic landmarks around the world, the Washington Monument. Comment below what topics you'd like to see explored in future episodes. This channel is not possible without your support making it happen.